It's the record button. Okay, let's see your dog. Uh, let's start off with the dog. <laughs> okay, well, look, life is not worth living without a good companion. He really is my travel companion. All Come right. Work, ski trips, holidays. His name's Teddy. 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 Yeah, he's like a big teddy bear. Okay, like Teddy Roosevelt. <laughs> Hopefully he'll give me uh, the time we need to talk without having to take him out for a walk or give him a snack. <laughs> Welcome to the Wonder Learn podcast. This is Francis Tapon. I'm here with Sam Kamel. That's right. C'est très bien comme ça. Uh, vous parlez français un peu? <laughs> On peut le faire en français, mais je crois qu'il faudrait mieux parler en anglais pour uh, tout le monde. C'est clair. D'accord. So, um, you are CEO, I believe, of Inside. I Inside, sorry. That's correct. Okay. And now tell I'm CEO you. and, uh, you know, hopefully chief visionary and everything else we've got to do to make this work. Great. Tell us a little bit about, uh, it's probably, it's not a household name, obviously. Yeah. So Einside has uh, been a company that's been around, uh, call it 16 years. Uh, I don't think of us as a startup. We're more of an upstart. We grew out of the world of sensors and technology, very much uh, techie, uh, B2B, if you want to think of it. Uh, we recently realized in working with airports that our data that we've been capturing for a long time can become available to the consumer, to the traveling individual, and really make a better experience in the airport. So we're working hard to, um, to get out of the obscurity of B2B and serving just airports and making sure that our data and uh, what we can do can help travelers. And you know, we just started working with TripIt, and TripIt in many ways is a very uh, user-friendly, consumer-friendly app. And that's our first foot, first step forward in that direction. Okay, so let's break this down to make it really simple for somebody who's just kind of tuning in and never and, and still doesn't understand what you're saying. Why should the average traveler care about this, Sam? In other words, like what's a practical application of how you can make the traveler's life at the airport a bit easier? Yeah, I think the reason they should care is because one, study after study shows that the security checkpoint experience in the travel journey is the low point when it comes to negative emotions, the most negative emotions. It's the high point when it comes to stress. And part of that is because there's no visibility. There's no predictability. There's no sense of, gee, should I leave to the airport two hours ahead of time or three hours ahead of time because of security? What will happen in this great unknown? So we provide visibility into that security experience. How long will it take? Is the, the line running short or is it running long? But our ultimate vision is to give the consumer traveler the, the time from the, from the curb to the gate. And today, you, all of us, whether we're leaving from the office or home or some other place, you can call up your favorite Uber, you can drive yourself, and you have a very good sense of home to the curb or to the parking lot at the airport. But from that point on, the journey is a black box. So we're bringing light to, the, to that part of the journey that has been in the past a very stressful experience based on all the data we've seen. Okay, and you're also doing this with baggage handling, is that true? Yeah, right now we are beginning with security and the get to the airport part of the journey. In the future, we think that the ability to know when a bag is gonna get off the airplane, move through the facility and come out at the baggage claim, that is possible. Uh, we just haven't wired up our data to take that data and make it part of the return home experience. But in the, in the future, we will make sure that that big unknown on the way home or at your destination, say you're going on a ski trip, you know, when will my skis be delivered? That's a possible problem and we can solve it. We just haven't done it yet. Okay. So we're focusing on human cues. In other words, human lines, correct? I think human cues or human motion indoors. And so whether that's a, how long will it take to get to my gate walking or where is going to be my next obstruction? And will that be a five minute queue or a 20 minute queue? So you can really plan your trip. Right. So the, I guess a cleanness analogy is everybody's, most everybody's familiar with Google Maps. They can kind of see when they have these red lines on the highway, it says red when high congestion, slowdowns, exactly. et cetera. And right. they give you an estimate, okay, getting to San Francisco today is going to take an hour. Normally it takes half an hour, but today is an hour. So then you right. kind of plan it. So it's kind of like that, but for a building like an airport, for example. Exactly. Take the Google Maps analogy and make it your airport, make it your train station, make it your football stadium, right? It's that last mile that Google Maps doesn't provide for, for all of us today. Okay. Now, most people who are listening to this are probably just imagining a slew of cameras, which of course, airports have cameras mm -hmm. in abundance. So yeah. a lot of people just assume that you're going to be using 
AI or just simple cameras to kind of figure out congestion just by looking at it. But I think that's not how you do it, correct? That's right. Our, uh, we have done cameras, infrared optical cameras. Uh, we think the new state of the art is using uh, technology that's more user friendly because it completely protects identity. It's called LIDAR. It's a laser beam or laser beams that sweep around and, and see in 3D. Um, cameras don't see in 3D, actually, by the way. They only see a 2D, right? So they have to intuit and do different things to look at cues and understand cue length and movement. They're pretty good in getting better, but there's always that personal identity issue, particularly in Europe and now with GDPR. So our system is really built in a... So, uh, uh, sorry, GDPR, explain that. Uh, GDPR is a set of privacy controls uh, initiated by the EU, making sure that user identity whether you're on the internet, using cookies or other means, is, is protected. And again, someone's image is, is a protected item under GDPR. And what does that stand for again? I'd have to double check with the analogy, uh, what the acronym is for. Um, general recognition. General data protection <laughs> requirements or something like that. Okay. But it's coming out of the EU and it's a good standard. It's going gonna, it's gonna to help us all feel safer on the internet. Okay, and so and LIDAR is also the same technology that self-driving cars are using to identify if there's a bicyclist in front of them and things like that, right? Correct. Bicyclist, pedestrian, another car, whatever the obstruction is, uh, Mercedes, Waymo, other cars are using LIDAR technology today. So you're using LIDAR technology in an airport itself, even though there's no real big risk of an accident of a car driving through, that kind of stuff. It's just, a, but it's a highly accurate laser that is able to accurately count human bodies, I suppose. Exactly. I mean, if you're going to trust LIDAR for your car and we're going to use it in a different use case. When we're going at uh, 80 miles an hour, you can trust it going at two miles an hour. Exactly. So it works really well for the scenario we're, we're working on to develop here. Yeah. Okay. And so basically, do you have to add infrastructure to airports in order for this to work? Because I imagine LIDAR isn't just automatically next to every single camera that's sitting at an airport. Yeah. And that's part of the heavy lifting we have to do. Um, in order to provide this consumer benefit, you know, we do what we've done as a legacy company is work with airports. Uh, we have to do the cabling. We have to do the sensor mounting. So there's a little bit of infrastructure work to be done. Uh, but the great thing is, uh, airports maybe three, four years ago weren't too interested in that, but now they're all becoming more interested in being better with customer satisfaction. That's I mean, they, surprising. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're going that way. So better sensors, better data. We think about smart airports and suddenly you have a smart airport capturing more data and then making that available to a traveler. Um, there, there's endless scenarios we can think about. But we're well, gonna take why, What happened in the last five years to make all scenarios? customers focused about that kind of stuff? I think a few things. Um, security has continued to be top priority. Travel has been growing at five to six to seven percent, maybe 10 percent, depending on the airport. And the number of airports that, uh, that exist uh, are still the same number. So you have a uh, limited capacity, growing utilization, and increasing friction in the form of security. And so that bottleneck is going to get worse and worse and eventually, we're going to come up with more efficient ways to get passengers through security or to, the, to their gate. But uh, in the past five years, thankfully, a good economy, globally, et cetera, the problem is only getting worse. Okay. And so this, who's paying for all this? In other words, who's going to pay your bills? Who's paying your salary right now? Which, yeah. Who's your customer? My customer is the airport in our traditional legacy model. But I think with innovation, we're, we're, we're evolving the business model. And airports uh, are under pressure in multiple ways. You know, how do you manage the capacity? But also, how do they continue to make money? And so one of, one of the things we're doing is as we use the data as airport to help the consumer journey become better, um, we're going to make some money off of that data business. And we're going to revenue share that back to the airport. So it's an incentive for the airport to install the infrastructure which they were planning to, to do anyway. And now they can actually benefit from that by having that data paid for by Ubers and Lyfts, uh, TripIt today, but I mentioned Uber and Lyft as possibilities for the future, or the airlines as well. Okay, so wait, so TripIt is paying you some money? Yes. Uh, okay, so Ironside is getting some money from TripIt, and then Correct. Ironside promises to share some of that revenue with the airport? Correct. 
Okay. All right. So, so they're kind of becoming a partner in this. And so that gives them a bit of incentive to say, Hey, you're going to get a little bit of revenue, but who, who is, doesn't the airport have to pay for the LIDAR installation, for example? Correct. The airport does have to pay for that. Okay. So for whatever sensor they're, they're putting into place. So there's a, I think there's momentum for the airports to begin to do the right thing. But as much as they have that capacity, they're also looking for ways to offset the cost. Do you know how many airports there are in the United States, approximately? There are approximately 524 airports in the United States. Approximately. None that you and I would think about, right? <laughs> commercial airports where we can go catch a right, flight. Right, right, right. Commercial we airports, not Private too. airfields and all that. Right, right, right. So 524. Okay. And then out of those, how many are, uh, do we have like 1% penetration at this point? Uh, yeah. So a couple of things. So the top 30 of those 524 uh, account for anywhere from 75 to 80 percent of all passengers. So I'll call those in planes. So Atlanta, Chicago, Dallas in the U.S., right? The very big airports account for most of the travelers. And the penetration for this technology, separate from what we provide, but what we and our competitors provide, is about 60 percent of the top 80 percent or the top 30 airports. Okay. So those large airports have a lot of budgets, uh, a lot of capital, and that's where the investment's going to be first. Uh, but eventually, we do see this trickling down to the top 50 airports, the top 100, so that you get a pervasive sense of this capability being, um, being unleashed. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, because I remember I was in the big island of Hawaii, and yeah. The airport there was kind of a joke. <laughs> Just like there, yeah. was, <laughs> there was like really nothing going on there. <laughs> As it like, should be. Yeah. Right. It's so white. <laughs> exactly. So it was just a very quiet, calm experience. And I was just like, wow, I guess you guys don't really need to help them out there. They're long yeah. lines because they yeah. don't really have long lines. Um, okay. So is there a difference? I mean, this is kind of an oddball question, but is there a difference tracking human beings and tracking baggage? Yes, yes. I mean, when we're tracking human beings, our sensors are capable of differentiating a tall human from a short human, something that looks like a bag. There's some AI built into the sensor technology or the processing of that sensor technology or sensor data. Um, but when it comes to bag tracking, and as we talked about earlier on, as bags are coming off the plane and getting brought up to the baggage claim, you know, there are various ways of, of doing that. And that may be a whole different set of technology using Bluetooth or RFID and other things versus either an optical or a LiDAR-based solution, right? But what we're, we're – I could get long-winded on this, but, yeah, it's usually a different form of sensor and a chipset that – It seems to me that the baggage thing would be an easier problem because you can throw an RFID tag onto the baggage. In a way, it is. And in, in a way, it's uh, not necessarily solving the technical problem, but making that data available in this, what we have is a, we call it the a travel data API platform. So what we want to do is add more and more scenarios for the traveler that, that makes the travel experience better. Okay. Getting through security, getting my bag. And the technology, what we want to do is abstract the technology and just have the data available so that TripIt can grab that data set and build it into their app. So United Airlines can grab the data and build it into their app. That's how this becomes consumer facing and consumer friendly. And our job is to find the sources of data, aggregate them, and make them part of the platform. Okay, so if somebody's listening to this and say, wow, this sounds pretty cool. I want to know when I got to load, I got to go to JFK Airport. Right. Um, can they just download the TripIt app, or is it in beta testing, or is it actually not ready yet? So, two things. Um, the TripIt app is working using Einside data today but not for JFK, right? For the moment, it's only working in the current airports that we have direct relationships with. Okay. Um, we are working with- uh, oh, Sorry, uh, how, ma how many airports are those roughly? Uh, today, that's four. Okay, four, and which four, four, which four, four airports? Can you name those four? Yeah, Orlando, Phoenix, Denver, are uh, the big ones in Austin, Texas. Okay, so if I'm in Austin, Texas, I could use the TripIt app and then find out roughly how long the line is gonna be. Absolutely, yep. Oh. So then, so then let's just go through the scenario. I log in, I'm in Austin, Texas. I look in Google Maps tells me it's going to take me an hour to get to the airport. And then I look at the TripIt app and says, okay, the lines are incredibly congested today because it's a Friday and therefore you need to get there an hour early. Correct. Got it. Right. So that's pretty much it? That's pretty much it. And TripIt right now is actually making that whole experience. You don't have to go to Google Maps anymore. TripIt is, um, again, this is innovation and features they're building into their app. 
but I was just told the other day at this conference, Focusrite, that TripIt is now notifying its passengers who go to these airports when it's time to leave to the airport, and they're automatically connecting the dots for you. So they're looking at where you are, the highway congestion, arrival at the curb, and then moving from the curb to your gate using our security checkpoint data. Got it. Okay, that's pretty sweet. Um, okay, so let's see. Now, what do you think of as the future of airline travel? How do you kind of, are you going to see basically, obviously we have a set amount of real estate out there. Are the airports just going to get bigger airports and we're just going to have more airports? Or do you see something kind of radical down the pipeline somehow change it? The most radical idea, by the way, I've heard is Elon Musk's idea of having these uh, rocket ships you know, fly up into the sky and then landing in Tokyo in, you know, one yeah. hour, yeah. And, you know, these one hour flights. I mean, in some ways it's not really radical. It's just faster plane basically. But yeah, I'm strap yourself to an uh, intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missile <laughs> exactly right. coming for a safe landing and you're good to go. Right. Um, so, but, but that's about as radical as I can think of. And even that is just a bit faster. It's more or less the same thing. You still yeah. got to wait in a security checkpoint to get on the rocket ship. <laughs> oh yeah. Big time. <laughs> Big time security there. Uh, I think that I've been to multiple airport conferences this past year. And one company that keeps coming up, which is a non-traditional airport participant, is Hyperloop. Oh, yeah, of course. So back to Elon Musk again, who is obviously visionary in many ways when it comes to transportation. But we're hearing more and more about airports using, uh, being coming the hub for Hyperloop connections. So say you take the Denver airport in uh, Colorado. Uh, you can take a Hyperloop to Denver airport and from there extend, you know, hop on an airplane. So um, very much like Europe, I think in the U.S., we don't have a really good integration between air travel and, and, and rail travel. Uh, I think Hyperloop brings in the speed, uh, makes it very simple. Uh, I think that's going to be where we see a few things happening. Um, and, you know, airport executives, when they think about who do they compete with, you know, they've had a bit of a monopoly. You know, if you want to get anywhere fast, you got to come to my airport. I think Hyperloop will start to break that monopoly a little bit. Here in Southern California, we think about autonomous vehicles. So if you want to get to Vegas, you can either drive yourself, hop a plane, it's very low cost, and 45 minutes, or you can hop in an autonomous vehicle. And there are businesses that today offer that capability. Maybe that's more competing with the bus, but in some ways it'll start to kind of, if travel from the airport becomes congested and the lines are too long and, uh, and, and all these other complexities, I think you're going to find at the local three to five hour trip, that's going to become one where airports are disrupted and they have to think about, hey, how do I provide as good a service and make it seamless compared to Hyperloop or autonomous vehicle travel? Got it. And what about for the future, your vision as of Ironside, where do you guys see yourself in, let's say, 10 years? Yeah, we would love to have the, the, the company that takes all these points of friction and travel. And, you know, we're looking at the airport as the, the, the hub where travel is going to still happen. Long distance travel, air travel, et cetera. And with mobile travel becoming the dominant form, everyone has a mobile travel app, Air France, United, uh, whatever favorite airline you have, or Uber and Lyft. Because right now Uber and Lyft are becoming the predominant means of getting to and from the airport versus taxis or your own personal car. And we want to be able to have the data set that gives you that visibility to the airport and then ultimately through the airport. Maybe you have a question about where should I park my car? And we're working with partners who will be able to answer that question for you. So you can drive directly to the parking spot that is open. Uh, right now, they're actually wiring all the parking spots to get a sense for availability in the next parking spot. You know, sometimes I go to the airport and I spend 10 minutes looking for my parking spot. So that'll go away. Uh, time to gate, as we've talked about, that'll go away. Uh, transfer from one point to the next. If you're running very tightly between a transfer airport, you'll know exactly how to get there, how long that'll take. And then when you arrive at your destination, maybe you need to get a rental car. Maybe you're going to say, well, I would uh, like to receive a notification from Expedia or Priceline that if I go to budget rental car and there's a five-minute wait line for my rental car versus the 40-minute line at, at Hertz, then maybe you can get an offer for a 10% discount at budget and save 35 minutes on your trip. So these are all little things where the time dimension becomes super exciting and we think you know, ubiquitous. It simply becomes part of how you travel because you know, we all look at Google Maps today when we're in our car and you have your mobile phone. So the mobile connected traveler 
will have these points of friction made easily accessible to them and reduce the stress and traveling is easier. Uh, one more thing I, I forgot to ask you about is how are you using Wi-Fi? I think I read somewhere on your website that yeah. you're somehow you're using Wi-Fi to kind of track congestion. So we historically used Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, uh, and we still do. But you know, Wi-Fi gives you a general sense of congestion: how many phones are logged on and how many phones are part of the airport Wi-Fi system, and we can read that telemetry and that that radio density. So it provides airports maybe a heat map. So for this is more of a I would say B two B application where the CIO of, of O'Hare can see where do my passengers go while they wait for their flight. Are they shopping? Are they are they hanging out by the gate? Or you know where are the heat maps? Uh, because of the lack of precision in Wi-Fi, it's getting better, uh, but there are you know some limited uses. Uh, I think there's a I think Apple is doing a really neat job with Wi-Fi and giving you a wayfinding capability. Right now with the Apple Maps, you can actually go indoor to the top hundred airports in the country or in the world, and they'll help you get a pretty good sense of where you are in the airport. And they'll give you a pretty decent map of where you are within the airport and whether you want to go straight, left, or right. Um, so that's where Wi-Fi comes into play. It's a bit more of a wayfinding. But again, it doesn't have great accuracy. It jumps around a lot. Um, and it doesn't quite serve what we need, which is LiDAR, so we can do very accurate time, you know, add the time frame to this whole experience. And Sam, how much does the LiDAR sensor cost, the ones you typically install at the airport? Well, right now it's expensive uh, to the tune of a few thousand dollars. Okay, like two thousand, three thousand dollars. More like three thousand. Okay, three thousand. But like every new technology, right? It gets, sure. it's going to come down. The Chinese are getting into the game. Cost of manufacturing are coming down. The scale, more volume is going to drive down cost. Got it. So we think we're on the front end, front end of that. So to install it, let's say at Orlando Airport, how many lidars did you need to put in there? We are actually working with that airport to install lidar. Uh, okay. In the past, for Orlando, need, are they going to need, let's say, a hundred lidar? No, no, no. They're going to need, I and mean, that's one of the huge advantages for the airport. They're going to need under a dozen. Okay, all right. Under a dozen, and boy, it has it has a great field of view. Uh, we don't need sensors everywhere. We don't need cameras over every step of the journey. Yeah, we're we're down to ten or twelve. Okay, that's good. So it's portable. I mean, yeah, it still adds up. You know, whatever that is, three. Uh, let's say three thousand dollars a pop. You're going to be spending. Yeah, thirty thousand yeah. bucks or so, maybe fifty thousand. I mean, of course, there's installation costs and that kind of stuff. You got to mount it exactly. and that kind of calibrate it and all that stuff. But anyway, right. interesting. Well, it's fascinating what you guys are doing, Sam. And uh, where can people learn a little bit more about uh, Eye Inside? Best place to go is uh, come by our website, uh, com. I I N S I D E dot com. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a Twitter site. We have um, we get notices and information through Twitter and LinkedIn. But our website's the best place to start. Yeah, I like the letter I, just like iPhone, but it's I inside. Great. Cool. Well, uh, pleasure talking with you, and uh, let's hope that uh, the airport lines go faster and faster every day. Great, and have a good trip. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> See you.